Okay. Good morning, everyone. Hey. Welcome to SQL Saturday number 109, Silicon Valley. We're really happy to see you here today. I'm Mark Ginnabaugh, and I'm the organizer of this event, along with uh, Ross Mystery to my right. And we're really glad to have you here. At this event, we have probably the, uh, the best assembled group of speakers for a SQL Saturday ever. Uh, many of them are in the front two rows. Welcome, speakers. We have SQL Server MVPs, authors, uh, members of the SQL Server team who came down from Redmond. Uh, we have people from uh, locally throughout the US and several from the UK. So again, welcome speakers. We're really ha happy to have you here at Silicon Valley. For our event, we had over 700 registrations. Uh, we have room for 550, so we're a little bit nervous. <laughs> but uh, also really meaningful to the, communi the community part of this event is that we had over 100 people volunteer to help us. So thank you very much to, to you for attending and to the volunteers. <laughs> we are a uh, sponsored event. It takes quite a, quite a few resources to pull together an event of this nature and to be able to have you come here for free. We've got a great group of sponsors. I'll talk more about them in a few minutes. But uh, it's really important that you take the time today to stop by the tables that they have down where the food is served and see what they have to offer to you and your organizations. They've uh, invested quite a bit in this event and, and it's uh, very important that we take a little bit of time and understand how, how we can work together with them. So thank you very much sponsors. And uh, a, another word about that, we've got some great door prizes. I'll give you a list of door prizes in a few minutes, but uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event. Okay. So we have three local user groups who are represented by, by this event. One is the Silicon Valley SQL Server user group, which meets at this facility on the third Tuesday evening of every month. The second is the San Francisco SQL Server user group, which meets on the second Wednesday evening of each month at 835 Market Street in San Francisco. The third group is the Bay Area Microsoft Business Intelligence user group, which uh, meets monthly on the first Thursday of each month. And we alternate the location between Mountain View, this facility, and 835 Market Street in San Francisco. We rotate back and forth month by month. So three really great local user groups. They're a, uh, a resource that I hope many of you are taking advantage of. And if you aren't at this point in time, I hope you will start doing so. There's going to be a lot of SQL Server 2012 content in the coming year. We have a local parent organization, the Bay Area Association of Database Developers, or BAD. It's bad.org. Uh, I encourage you to join. Membership is $35 a year. It's really a great organization. I've been involved in it for about 15 years. Our international parent organization is PASS, Professional Association for SQL Server, sqlpass.org. And uh, PASS uh, the, is represented very well in this uh, event today. We have PASS's uh, incredible community evangelist, Carla, uh, Landrum, who's here today. She, I'm sure you saw her down in the check-in area and you'll see her throughout the day. I hope you take a few minutes to get to know her and understand a little bit more about the past community from her. She's a great resource. I spent the last year working closely with her when I was on the past board and I'm thrilled to have her here. We also have three past board members uh, present. Uh, Denise McInerney is uh, newly elected and she's uh, uh, in the front row. She'll be... Yep. She will be heading the Women in Technology uh, panel discussion that will be held over lunchtime, and she'll also be speaking at the event. We also have immediate past president, Rashab Mehta. Uh, is Rashab here yet this morning? I saw him in his workout clothes at the hotel, so he should be here any time, and he's going to be looking very fit 
and well showered. <laughs> and uh, also with us today is uh, the past president, Bill Graziano. And uh, please welcome Bill Graziano. He'll, he'll say a few words about past. We're very happy to have you in town, Bill. Thank you. I want to welcome you all here. I think, I, I, don't, I don't have the actual numbers in front of me, but I think you're at one of our largest SQL Saturday events ever. So uh, I think that's just amazing. This is the 109th of these events that we've put on. And when I say we've put on, I don't really mean pass. It's the local people doing this. So I want to thank Ross Mystery and Mark Jenabaugh for doing this. The amount of effort you have to do to put one of these on is pretty amazing, as I think as you'll see everything that goes into this. Uh, I do want to mention one other board member who's here, or ex-board member. Uh, Kevin Klein is also downstairs, uh, and he was the former president for four years. So uh, the last thing I want to do is point out two events that we have. Uh, we have a SQL rally event coming up in May in Dallas, uh, and that'll be our uh, mid-year conference. Uh, should be somewhere between 500 to 1,000 people, a fantastic event to go to. And then last is our SQL Summit. That's going to be in November in Seattle. And uh, if you like this, imagine this with, I don't know, probably about 4,000 people in it. So we'll have the largest collection of SQL Server professionals that you'll get in one place ever. So uh, hope to see you all there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bill. And I've signed up for the rally, and I'll be at the summit for sure as well. OK, so uh, just a very brief list of our sponsors. We have two launch sponsors, Microsoft and DesignMind. This is, a, this is a 2012 launch event in addition to being a SQL Saturday. We have platinum sponsors, Confio, Quest, Quickstart, Redgate, and Riverbed Technologies. Gold sponsors, Adara, LearnIt, Penn and Publishers, with, Pens and Publishers which publishes SQL Server Pro Magazine. We've got Terrace Consulting and Windwire Technologies. Silver sponsors include Dynamics Edge, Fusion IO, and Cozy Rock. And uh, the party that we'll be having at the end of the event today down in the cafeteria is sponsored by Redgate. Raffle prizes. So we've got some really great prizes today. We've got an Xbox to give away. The Xbox. Uh, in order to qualify for the Xbox, you're going to need to fill out the speaker evaluation form. You're going to each get one form that you can fill out over the course of the day for the, the sessions that you send or that you attend. And then you will uh, provide us with that, and you'll be eligible for the drawing for the Xbox. There will also be a set of Bose headphones, a couple of Kindles, an iPad 2, gift cards, books, and more. These are all donated by sponsors. Now, the raffle, uh, it's a little bit mysterious maybe if you're coming in and you've never been to a SQL Saturday, but the way it works is if you printed out your speed pass that has your name badge, you also have various raffle tickets. And you can cut that up. You take your raffle tickets to the, the vendors who are printed on the different tickets. You've got to put that in the box uh, on their table in order to be part of their drawing. At the end of the day, each of those vendors is going to do their own drawing from the tickets that were put in their box for the prize or prizes that they're giving away. Okay. For the event schedule, just kind of top level, these are one hour sessions other than the keynote that'll be slightly longer. We'll have breaks in the morning and in the afternoon. Lunch starts at 12.15 downstairs. And at 12.45, we're going to have a a women in technology panel discussion in this room. And we have uh, three uh, vendor presentations, which will be held in other rooms. Now, there aren't, all of this information, by the way, is on a printed calendar, which most of you have not received yet. But there are, but there are copies of this out, outside or just inside every room for the, uh, that you'll go to for the next event. So you'll have those available. Afternoon sessions will start at 1.30. We'll have an afternoon break. When the last session ends, we'll all gather downstairs, and we're going to have a drawing for the raffle prizes. You must be present to win, but like I said, there's some great, there's some great prizes. And upon conclusion of that, we'll kick off a, a little party, a little after party sponsored by Redgate, and then call it a night. 
This morning's keynote speaker, uh, who will be assisted by others, who he will, who he will uh, uh, introduce, is Ross Mystery. Ross is my co-organizer in this event. He's a uh, principal enterprise architect at Microsoft. I'd like to turn things over to Ross Mystery. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right, so good morning, and thank you very much, Mark and Bill, for those great introductions. So I'm not one for jokes, I'm not one for telling stories, but I do have one story from this morning. And I promised an individual I'll have to thank her. So independent of the speakers, independent of Mark and Bob and all the great work he's done, I need to thank one person. So this morning, I left the hotel room. I live in the East Bay, but I decided I'd get a hotel on this side of town. Therefore, I can get to the session as soon as possible. I came off of 101, exited off of Shoreline, and traditionally in the morning, we have Microsoft traffic, we have Google traffic, we have LinkedIn traffic. It takes 20 minutes to exit that specific ramp, get onto Shoreline. This morning, there was no traffic whatsoever, so I whipped right through, made my right turn. Right in front of the campus, police sirens came up. <laughs> and I was like, I'm running a little late. Officer pulls me over. She goes, do you know you're not allowed to make a right turn at, that light, at a red light there? And I was like, you know, I had no idea I, could, I couldn't do that. Typically in the morning, there's so much traffic that I've never had the opportunity to even do this, right? <laughs> so then I told her, look, I'm doing a keynote speech. I'm sort of nervous. I typically don't get nervous. I'm a little nervous right now. I'd be indebted to you if you could just let me go because I have six to 700 people waiting for me at a conference. <laughs> so I say, what conference is it? So I showed her my Microsoft badge. I go, I'm right at the campus. We're launching this great product named SQL Server. She's like, what's SQL Server? I'm like, one of the best data platforms out there <laughs> in the world. And um, she decided to let me go. So I'm indebted. <laughs> I'm indebted to Officer Suave. And um, I wanted to thank her for letting me go in order for me to be here. Otherwise, I have no idea how many other tickets I have or how many warrants out there. I may, even, I may have not been here. So I, I, would, I definitely want to thank her for that. So let me, let me just switch over the slide deck here. And we can get started. OK, so let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Ross Mystery. I'm one of the enterprise architects out of the Microsoft Technology Center in this facility. And I design solutions for Microsoft's largest customers in the West region, specifically around the data platform space. Um, my specialty is I enjoy high availability, disaster recovery, consolidation, virtualization. And I spend a lot of time in the appliance space, specifically around our private cloud. I want to thank everybody for making it here on a Saturday. I know it's not easy with weekend commitments. And I do appreciate the community, how strong it is. I definitely encourage everyone to tweet, get involved in the community. I believe I started off my career doing a lot of public speaking for the small user groups 10 years ago. And I eventually graduated up to higher speaking engagements pass. And I'm very proud to keynote the SQL Server 2012 event today. So definitely get involved with the community. I think the PATH community is great. People like Mark has done an excellent job. Bill Graziano in charge of the PATH organization right now. So I definitely encourage everyone to get involved. With that being said, I'm going to get started. So today's agenda, what I'm going to focus on is truly articulating the key capabilities affiliated with SQL Server 2012. I'm going to focus on some of the areas such as peace of mind, business intelligence, and um, let me just fix my slide deck here. It's not changing. Let's try that again. Agility of cloud, how you can leverage the cloud, cloud on your terms, and finally, beyond relational. I have a lot of colleagues from the product group, also our specialists from the area, who will co-speak with me, so I'm definitely proud to have these individuals in the room. Let's get started with our industry trends. So if you're looking at software purchasing over the, next, over the past couple years, over the next few years, if you look at the ways we've made investments in the product, there's traditionally three trends that are transpiring right now that helped influence our decisions with SQL Server 2012. The first one is data explosion. So as we're all aware, data has grown in the organization exponentially over the past 10 years. There's some statistics out there that indicate that data will grow by approximately 44 times over the next five to 10 years with regards to individuals capturing more information, organizations capturing click information, more video streaming, more 
pictures on cameras being uploaded. So again, we're up against a situation where there's tremendous amount of data being stored within our organizations, and that leads to a big data problem. So as you're all aware too, we, are, we had a strata conference this week, and there's definitely a lot more emphasis on data explosion, big data, and how to handle big data problems. The next one is consumerization of IT. If you look at consumerization of IT, there's a lot of trends that are taking place where individuals have great devices from a consumer perspective. However, they bring these devices into the corporate infrastructure and they may not be supported or they're expecting the same experience as the corporate infrastructure. However, the corporate infrastructure may be 10 years lagging in technology. So they don't get that same um, experience or there's pressure on IT individuals to support these type of technologies. So we had a high tech conference a few days back at um, the computer museum and many C-level executives indicated that this is a major concern. They need to support these devices. However, they're not too sure how to secure them. They're not too sure how to practically manage 100,000 of these devices. So again, a major dilemma, a major trend within the industry that individuals need to be taking, um, taking into consideration. The next one is private cloud and public cloud. So, if you look at some of the buzzwords five to 10 years ago, a lot of, lot of, um, a lot of work around virtualization. I think now industry trends are looking at public cloud solutions where individuals can take advantage of public solutions or public cloud solutions such as SQL Azure or the ability to have private cloud solutions. So if you're not quite ready for the journey to the cloud, you may build out a private cloud infrastructure and that can be utilized to host your SQL Server databases. With that being said, if we look at all the different key capabilities affiliated with SQL Server 2012, some of the new features are really key aligned to these three specific pillars. And I would look at these pillars as mission critical confidence. So the first thing is, how do I achieve high availability, disaster recovery, performance and scale at the lowest total cost of ownership? Again, I believe this time right now is very challenging from an organization's perspective. Corporate IT is forced to reduce the cost with regards to budgets, IT as a service, and again, people are looking for solutions that can lower the total cost of ownership as opposed to let's spend more money in today's challenging economy. The next one's breakthrough insights. So how do I unlock pervasive insight from all this data stored within my organization? Therefore, I can bolster my organization's um, competitive advantage, again, within a challenging economy. And finally, cloud on your terms. So as opposed to pushing people into a specific direction, give individuals options. They have the ability to de develop solutions on-premise, the ability to develop solutions in a public cloud environment or in a private cloud or environment, or finally, a hybrid solution. Maybe I have some on-premise, some in the cloud, and some within a private cloud solution. So I look at these are the three key, I'd say, pillars within our cloud information um, platform. So this one here is ultimately an eye chart, just to ensure that everyone can see in the back. However, if you look at these features, we've released over 200 to 300 features affiliated with the SQL Server 2012 product. I'm not going to go into every single one today because I only have an hour and we are running a little late, but I do want to call out some of the key features such as availability, column store index. We're going to talk about our breakthrough insights and look at some demonstrations around PowerView and finally look at some of the beyond relational capabilities. So we're going to focus on those four specific areas and then we definitely have a lot of deep dive sessions throughout the day that will cover a lot of these, more, these technologies further in depth. So with that, let's get started with mission critical confidence. So firstly, what we're looking at is organizations came to us and said, we definitely believe you're doing a good job with your existing technologies. However, we want more. You do offer clustering. You do offer database mirroring. You do offer log shipping. You do offer peer-to-peer -peer replication. You potentially even have live migration if you're utilizing a virtualization environment. We can achieve high availability. Um, in a lot of my design sessions with customers, a traditional solution would be, I want to design HA within a data center. I might use a failover cluster. And then if I want to extend that capability into a disaster recovery scenario, I might add on database mirroring. However, database mirroring at times is a one-to-one -one solution. Therefore, I can achieve disaster recovery to one site, but if I require disaster recovery to more than one, uh, more than one data center, I might be forced to now use log shipping as opposed to database mirroring. So as you can see, the technologies were there. However, it may have been fragmented. I had to combine technologies. So people came back to us and said what they were looking for is a single integrated solution where I can achieve both high availability, disaster recovery, and at the same time leverage the hardware utilization affiliated with my environment. So we've introduced a new brand of technologies known as Always On. And within Always On, we have 
Always On Availability Groups, which is a brand new technology, and we've also enhanced Always On Failover Clustering, which is providing new forms such as multi-subnet failover clusters, which can easily be stretched over geographic locations. The next thing what we've done in, in order to increase availability, but at the same time security, is supporting SQL Server 2012 directly on Windows Server Core. So firstly, Windows Server Core, for those who have not used it, was introduced in Windows Server 2008, Windows Server 2008 R2, and it's ultimately a scaled down version of the operating system, which is pretty much command based or command line based. We don't have your traditional GUI tools, we remove the Explorer, therefore you're having a reduced surface attack and you have minimized installation to help bolster security. Now with SQL Server 2012, we do support that directly on server core. Uh, we also made some announcements this week where if you had the opportunity to work on Windows Server 8 or download the Windows Server 8 preview, going forward, our recommended installation approach on these software such as Windows Server 8 will be the default standard as let's leverage server core first as opposed to um, a full installation or, or, or a GUI-based installation. When you're using SQL 2012 on server core, you get some additional benefits such as a reduced security footprint, therefore less surface attack is um, exposed from a, from a hacking perspective. At the same time, we're also increasing planned downtime because less operating system, less patches are required, therefore less reboots are required from a SQL Server perspective. We've also made things a lot more simple. So individuals are looking for an integrated solution. So as opposed to being a cluster expert, and I do have a few cluster experts in the room, um, you do have the ability to do majority of these configurations directly from Management Studio. So I think a lot of people were intimidated. I'm not a cluster expert, I can't use these technologies. Therefore, we moved majority of these configurations directly within Management Studio in order to bolster your experience. We also have tremendous amount of um, support through PowerShell, so you can automate majority of these items. Also, all is on availability groups comes with a very powerful dashboard. So not only do you have the ability to implement a solution, but you can leverage a dashboard to understand the health of the environment, the health of the availability groups, the health of all the different replicas. So it's definitely a very powerful tool. And I'll showcase some of this in a demo. Finally, we have tight system center alignment. So majority of our tools have managed, or majority of our softwares have management packs. And if we use tools such as configuration manager or operations manager, for example, we have the ability to leverage our system center suite and have proactive monitoring of our SQL Server environment and have deep integration right down to the availability group level. So again, very tight alignment from a system center perspective. Another item that we're looking at over here is active secondaries. So many people came back to us specifically in, in an active passive environment and indicated, you know, I'm achieving high availability, I love these solutions, but I may spend $10,000, $20,000 on a server and that server is specifically idle. It's being used maybe once a year, once every six months, God forbid I do put a failover or a disaster takes place. So I want to be able to leverage those, those secondaries or those passive nodes in order for me to get greater hardware utilization. Um, in the past, we might have used database mirroring, created a snapshot off that mirror, read that mirror, and it became challenging. It looks a few people are nodding there. I could have done maybe replication and replicated off to a secondary, and then I could read off that secondary. The goal with the always on availability groups is that we can have multiple replicas and these secondary replicas could be utilized for read-only operations such as business intelligence reporting, I can utilize it for backups or some maintenance tasks. So the goal here is let's increase the hardware utilization and reduce the total cost of ownership affiliated with the database platform implementation. Here's an example of availability groups in action. So the underlying technology behind availability groups is a traditional Windows Server cluster. However, I don't require shared storage. I have the ability to launch this on SAN solutions if necessary, or I can go local storage. A specific solution that many people ask us to design would be, again, I want to achieve high availability within the site. God forbid the site goes down. I want to be able to fail over to another disaster recovery scenario or the data center. So let's say I look at this specific example. I have a primary replica residing in New York. I have a secondary replica in New Jersey and I'm utilizing a synchronous data um, commit movement between the two servers. Therefore, I'm achieving pretty much zero data loss between these different locations. And then I have a third server which resides in another geo location such as Hong Kong, and God forbid New York goes down or New Jersey, I have the ability to fail over to another geo location. So again, I'm achieving both HADR in a single integrated solution. I'm not combining clustering with mirroring or log shipping with mirroring or vice versa, single integrated solution. And at the same time, I could leverage these secondaries for read-only operations, such as reporting. 
All right, so with that being said, why don't we attempt to do a demo, and I'm assuming the demo gods will be on my side and everything will be operational here. Okay, so I will have to zoom in here so you guys can see from the back. Before I do that, let me just do some expanding here. Ah, there we go. All right, so in this specific environment, what I have is three SQL Server instances, all running on standalone hardware, actually running out of our Microsoft Technology Center from our colleagues over at Dell and storage on EMC VNX. Um, in this specific environment, I have three instances. And assuming that I have two instances residing in San Francisco, the third instance is in, let's say, Toronto. And I'm utilizing Toronto as a disaster recovery scenario. The goal here with availability groups, I can have more than one availability group within an instance. Therefore, I can have an availability group for my finance databases. I can have another availability group for my HR databases. These availability groups can fail over independent of one another. So in a traditional cluster, I might have 10 databases. If that cluster fails or the node fails, all 10 databases fail over. Database mirroring, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Therefore, if I have one database fail over, but there's two databases affiliated with that solution, it was challenging to make them fail over as a single unit. So in this environment, I have two finance databases, I have two HR databases. I already have an availability group created for my finance databases. And let me expand and show you how that looks. So in this scenario, what I have is the three specific servers. It's showing that BL4601 is a primary server, 4602 is a secondary server, 4603 is a secondary in my geo target in for Toronto, for example. I have two finance databases affiliated with the finance availability group, and I also have this new concept known as a finance listener. So the goal is similar to like a traditional cluster. When I connect to the cluster, I don't have to connect to the virtual node one, or sorry, the physical node one, physical node two. I'm connected to a virtual name. So an availability group, each availability group has its own listener, and it acts as a virtual network name that my applications connect to. Therefore, if the database is running on server one, server two, or server three, it doesn't matter. It automatically gets routed to the appropriate um, copy. In addition to that, if I have read-only type operations, I can indicate that the read-only operation should not go off the primary replica. It should go to the secondary or third in a specific order. So this would be a great example of an availability group. And why don't I create another availability group for my HR databases? So here, I have a wizard known as the availability group wizard. I give it an availability group name. So in this specific scenario, I'll call it HR. Um, finance. I have different databases within my environment. So it tells me that the finance databases are already in play with another availability group. So rule of thumb here, a database can be affiliated with one availability group. It cannot be affiliated with more than one. The two HR databases are available, so I'm going to check them. Now this is where I choose the different replicas to partake in the scenario. And I'll, I'll zoom in once I configure this so you can see it better. But ultimately, I'm going to connect to each of the servers. I'm going to give it the specific role. So server one will be primary. The other two will be secondary. I indicate do I want automatic failover? Do I want synchronous database movement or asynchronous database movement? So I'll say synchronous and automatic failover within the geo location, such as San Francisco. But then perhaps we will not do a synchronous across the wire to the, geo, um, the disaster recovery site. I then have the ability to choose, do I want read-only secondaries? And whether or not th these secondaries can be utilized for read access, so I'm going to say yes. I will do a quick zoom so you can see this. However, it's pretty straightforward configuration. I then have endpoints, which I choose. And the endpoint is ultimately the, the port and the encryption where the traffic is being replicated across. I have backup priority. So I can say, OK, yeah, for this specific solution, I want this database backup to occur on number two, then number three, before impacting the performance on number one. I create the listener. So how will everybody connect to this specific database or database availability group? I'm going to call this one HR listener. I give it a specific um, IP address and port. And voila. I choose where I want the files to be replicated. and fire away. 
So as you can see, it's an it's a integrated solution. It's very quickly to, to um, configure. Behind the scenes, I did initialize this by creating a Windows failover cluster, but it's a very straightforward process. While that's going through, I'll take a sip. Yeah, that's it, it's complete. So now what I have is not only my finance availability group, I have my HR availability group, all my different copies or replicas, the availability group database is affiliated with that, and I can even click on the specific scenario and look at the actual dashboard affiliated with that. Right, so with that being said, I just wanted to showcase how quickly it is to implement availability groups. You shouldn't see a red X up there, however it is a demonstration. <laughs> but um, with that being said, it's a very integrated, quick solution. I think this is probably the biggest feature from a DBA perspective, where many organizations are looking at achieving both HA, DR, take advantage of secondaries, at the same time, reduce the total cost of ownership. All right, so let me flip back to um, the presentation. And I was expecting a thunderous applause. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the next is blazing fast performance. So we made some enhancements with regards to performance. One is a column store index. A second one is really tailored towards file stream and having multiple containers affiliated with our file stream data. And Michael Reese, one of our program managers, will talk further about beyond relational. Perhaps we'll get into some of the file stream stuff in, in later slides. What I'll focus on right now is our column store index. So the goal here is to accelerate queries specifically with data warehousing. As I mentioned, there, there's a large, um, there is a large explosion of data occurring, big data problems are occurring, and one of the challenges that we experience with so much data, individuals would want to obtain pervasive insight. And some of the challenges they experienced was that they would fire a query to obtain some kind of specific data from their organization, and with so much data, by the time the query returned, they either forgot what the question was, what they were trying to solve, or the second item would be they lost that business opportunity. So the goal here was what can we do to accelerate queries specifically around data warehouses? So we introduced a new column store index directly in the database engine. So a lot of people felt that it's not possible, it was not something we can achieve, but we put a new column store database, um, sorry, column store index directly within the database engine. Therefore, it's straightforward to use within a few clicks. You have a wizard, you're up and running with the column store on a specific database. The goal here is with the new column store index, you're accelerating queries by 10 to 100 times. And in this one specific test in our labs, we had acceleration of over 400% on a specific um, data warehouse solution. So again, I just look at this as a second major um, investment from a DBA's perspective in order to accelerate queries within your data warehouse workloads. Without going into um, under the hood too much, we do have a dedicated session on this throughout the day, so I definitely recommend looking at that. But in terms of what we're doing here, as opposed to storing data across rows, we're storing data in a column-based fashion. In addition to that, we have an, we've made some enhancements with regards to our advanced processing, and we've also leveraged the technology in VertiPack which is our compression technology with SQL Server 2008 R2 analysis services and Power Pivot, and use that technology or compression directly in the database engine. So we're getting compression ratios which are far more superior than what we saw in the past. By storing data in a column fashion as opposed to a row fashion, you're putting a lot more, the data is more similar. Therefore, getting a better compression ratio. In addition to that, by only fetching columns that you require as opposed to scanning the whole row, you're seeing performance accelerated, as I indicated, by 10 times, 100 times, based upon that specific workload. So I definitely recommend going to the session, understanding more about column store indexing, and it's definitely a great way to um, enhance your performance on data warehouse workloads and queries. We've made some enhancements around the security perspective, better separation of duties, expanded audit capabilities. I did want to call out this slide because I think Microsoft's very proud of it. If you look at SQL Server and, and known vulnerabilities, we're right now leading the database industry with the least amount of vulnerabilities recorded um, in the environments compared to our other, other competitors. So that's something we're definitely proud of and I want to call it out by having this fancy slide and, and graph to showcase. With regard to some of the items that we did enhance within the security perspective is powerful encryption technology. So we've had TD encryption, we continue to deliver TD encryption where you encrypt your data at rest. 
We can interact directly with Active Directory and certificate authority or certificate services with AD and encrypt data in transit through, through a PKI infrastructure. We have the ability to interact directly with our system center products and have tighter compliance. So many times I'll build out compliance solutions for our customers who are regulated or Fortune 500 companies that are regulated by some form of compliance like HIPAA or um, PCI. And we do solutions where we, in, we take advantage of audit capabilities within SQL. Let's say for instance, we need to record invalid login attempts. What we'll do is we'll have any invalid login attempt, we'll utilize the audit specification or the database audit specification in a solution and then um, write these invalid login attempts directly to a Windows security log. And then we leverage our operations manager solution and we groom those security logs into a centralized database, integrate that with our email and alerting and send out emails to our DBAs. God forbid a breach has taken place. So as you can see, you can achieve compliance end to end with the different technologies and build robust solutions. We've also introduced other features to control access. So we've now created new user-defined server roles as opposed to just database-defined um, server roles. So this allows for better separation of duties. We have default schema for groups. In the past, we could not assign a default schema to a, a group. Therefore, we had to do it based upon a user, which made things very challenging from an administrative perspective. We, now have a, we also have now a new contained database authentication. So as opposed to storing the, 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 the login in the actual database engine, we have it in, in encapsulated into the actual database itself. Therefore, when you have portability, such as always on availability groups or challenges that we had in mirroring, if you move databases from one server or one instance to another instance, you're not concerned with not having the appropriate logins coming over also, we'll bring that for you. So definitely something you should take into consideration and try out. SQL Server auditing, again, we've enhanced the auditing. So let's say you're not using a Windows um, specific security log, you're using the, the SQL Server security log. Better resilience, if, fail, if, if the log is not available, we could have retries, therefore the server won't shut down if you're in a, in a specific situation. We have the ability to have where clauses and filter out specific audits. But again, tight alignment with the different products and you can achieve end-to-end -end encryption and compliance with the different solutions in play. Finally, peace of mind. So other items that we've introduced is distributed replay. We have the ability to look at specific transactions and replay them from a testing perspective. System center advisor alignment. We've also included new management packs as I indicated earlier. There's other free tools that we can use to help plan your migration to SQL Server 2012. So one would be upgrade advisor. So we can take a specific database from SQL 2008, SQL 2005, analyze that code to validate will it um, be compatible with SQL Server 2012? Will there be any specific blockers which will prevent you from upgrading to the latest and greatest or migrating your database across? So I definitely recommend utilizing some of those tools. In addition to that, we have um, migration assistance. So if you are coming from a competitor platform, we can help in that migration and help you move over to SQL Server 2012. And also we have migration assessment and planning toolkit known as like the MAPS toolkit. So Right now, a very common theme would be, let me design a consolidated infrastructure or let me take advantage of a private cloud implementation. In a private cloud implementation, what I can do is I can scan my existing database infrastructure and identify all my databases, identify all my instances, and then consolidate them into a smaller footprint onto a multiple instance failover cluster into a private cloud solution so you can take advantage of the rapid provisioning, the centralized management. So definitely a lot of different tools out there for peace of mind. And one of the other things that they do call out is a great community. Not that many other organizations have a great community such as the people in the room today to help or the partners affiliated with the product. So with that being said, I'm gonna hand off to Alex Vieira. He's gonna showcase some of our new breakthrough insights with regards to business intelligence. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Okay. No, I, I think I'm fine. Okay, um, I wanted to thank you again for your time today. I, I had a little bit of doubts when Ross originally put this together. I was saying no one's going to show up on a Saturday. So I owe him some money now. Okay. How much? How much? <laughs> we'll discuss that later. <laughs> okay. So I have about 10 slides and I wanted to get a demo of PowerView and really kind of show you some of the new capabilities that we're going to have uh, moving forward. And what I wanted to really talk about here is just 
just basically looking at um, some of the feedback we've we've received from a lot of customers and talking to a, a lot of ex experts in the industries and just kind of looking at the state of business intelligence. And when you really look at it, um, a lot of people are spending time hunting for information, but they're not spending a lot of time being able to analyze that data. And if you look at your day-to-day -day life at work, a lot of times, especially for me, um, you end up searching for a lot of data. Luckily, when you get into an environment with using SharePoint and those types of collaboration platforms, uh, it'll make it a lot easier and decrease that amount of time that's necessary for finding the information that's relevant to you. Um, if you take a look here, about 32% of the Excel users are comfortable with using it. Um, let me ask you this, how many people have at least touched and played with a pivot table? If I would have asked you that question about five years ago, probably one-fifth of you would have put your hands up. And this is kind of uh, a good testament to the fact that people are becoming more comfortable with utilizing these uh, more, what used to be perceived as more advanced uh, capabilities. So what we're seeing is that more and more are comfortable with this. And this was kind of the premise for us moving forward and saying, you know what, maybe it makes more sense to give people access to data and let them do what they want to do with that data instead of just trying to build structure reports and then that's the end of the road for that data. Okay, so we want to put the power into the user's hands. Taking a look at BI initiatives, especially around some of the things that we do, uh, if, if you've ever seen some of the um, analysis server projects, and some of, sometimes they can get pretty wide as far as scope goes. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that have tried to roll out different uh, types of uh, business intelligence applications, and usually by the time they get it out there, by the, by the time it's out there, it's already too late. The, ch the, whole, the whole specifications have changed, and a lot of times uh, s some kind of prototype becomes a mission-critical application, and because it wasn't architected correctly, they don't usually scale very well. So we want to be able to get away from that, and as you'll see as I go through this talk today, you'll see what we've done to kind of try to alleviate that, that situation right there. I think the first thing I want to point out here, uh, you can't have great reports without credible data. And take a look on the right-hand side here where people end up spending a lot of their time searching for information. And you can see that the top performers versus the bottom, bottom performers, the big difference here is the amount of data that they have available to them as far as the accuracy and credibility of that data. So you can see there's a dramatic time savings in productivity as we go from having good data to not having such great data. And if you think about it in your own, own life and day-to-day -day, uh, work, uh, you can kind of probably figure out where you fit within this scale. So what we've done with 2012 SQL Server is we've added three components to kind of help you in this area. The first two are to help you get this credible, consistent data. The third one is a way to be able to publish that data and let people be able to report and uh, diagnose and analyze that data. So we'll go ahead and take a look at some of these and what they achieve. So first off here, I wanted to talk about data quality services. Data quality services is something new that we're adding to the product. But when you take a look at this left-hand column here, uh, when you're dealing with formats, standards, consistency, accuracy, you know, duplicates, uh, whether you're loading a data warehouse or you're just doing some kind of uh, operation on data and trying to profile that data, a lot of times, a lot of these... Um, a lot of these types of problems that you see that can come up here, in the end, they end up costing you money and time, okay? And this is one of the things that data quality services is meant to solve. Uh, this does it through a knowledge base, and I have another slide on it to just kind of sum up what, what we can do there. But I just wanted to give you a, a high-level overview right here. The next thing is master data services, again, a part of SQL Server. 
When you take a look at the problems that we try to address with master data services, the biggest one that comes to mind for me is inconsistencies and anything that is a mistake as far as data. If we don't have one version of the truth in the long run, that ends up costing you money. Think about if you move from one house to another and your patient records that, uh, that, or some billing records from PG&E or whoever, they end up going to the wrong place. You get some kind of charges or something like that. It costs them money and it could possibly cost you money as well by not having uh, the right information there. So what we want to be able to do is make sure that we can get one version of the truth and that we can have people collaborate uh, and be able to work with the same data and pull this data together. One thing about master data services is we give you the tools and technology to do this. And it, it, for, all, for any of you that have dealt with master data services, you know there's a people and process part of this as well. Uh, unfortunately, we can give you some guidance there, but it's something that uh, you have to work out within your organizations to put that process in place. Now, what I wanted to do here was talk about this circle of data management right here. So first off, um, I think a lot of people are familiar with integration services. Can I get a hands there? Yeah, so everyone's pretty much familiar with integration services. Uh, we made some dramatic improvements in integration services. And some of them are subtle, but they're big time savers. Uh, one of them is about integrated uh, deployment and management. Well, when you take a look at having an SSIS package that you develop, you know that you push that up to the server and you have one folder that has all your packages. And every, packages has, every package has a one-to-one -one mapping to a connection manager or possibly multiple connection managers within that package, right? So what we want to be able to do is say, hey, I have a group of packages that are part of my solution. So I want to take that solution and be able to push that up to the server and manage it as a solution. Okay? So when you look at the folders that you see inside of Management Studio, you're going to see your solution name and then all the packages that sit underneath that. So you're no longer having to go in and cre put together creative names for packages just to keep them separated in the list as you know it now. Another very big deal here is also having shared connection managers. So at the high level, you can have connection managers with the solution, and that way is you're moving packages from test development and to production. When you want to change the connections, you change them at the solution level, and all the packages know about that change. So global connection managers, global, uh, uh, global variables, and glo global parameters as well. That makes sense. That's, I think that's a huge improvement over what we have now. Another thing I think you'll be very happy, and I, I, just one more comment on integration services, is Control Z. All right. <laughs> it might not seem like a very big thing, but being able to do Control Z to back out of something that you just did, very big, very big thing there. And also the flow of when you're dragging and dropping tasks. Um, before, if you're dragging and dropping tasks on the design surface, you had to do it in order. And so if your brain was thinking about, well, I can, I'm th just thought about this other area of this project, and now I, I want to drag and drop this other task, you couldn't do it. So the other thing that we added there was kind of making each task independent, and then you can wire them together. Okay? So that's integration services. Data quality services. The big thing here with data quality services is having a knowledge base so that if you go and make a change, if you see something that's wrong with data and you make a change, that goes into the knowledge base. And so the next time we see that exact problem, we can go in and make that fix for you. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel or to try to go back to that scenario. So let me give you a, a, a good, simple um, example. You have a database and you're trying to scrub the data that's going into your data warehouse. And the data warehouse has one column in there that's all the states. So we have 50 states. But all of a sudden, you get one piece of data that comes in that says A-R-I-Z instead of A-Z for Arizona. So you go into the knowledge base, and you correct that. And then the next time we see that, we'll automatically make that change and flag it to you. You'll also be able to take advantage of this knowledge base to be able to scrub your data for duplicates, scrub your data for formats, and be able to profile your data. So where can we use this functionality? 
We can use it as a standalone product to be able to scan our data, but what we can also do is we can take advantage of using an SSIS component and have that be part of our package so that we can scan through and again have the ability to say things that are, we have problems with go off in one direction and things that are okay or we can automatically fix will continue to go into our database so that you can make those changes. So some big changes there. Um, master data services can take advantage of data quality services as well. And in fact, the recommended installation for these is to put those both on the same server so that it can communicate together. Okay. On the master data services side, I, I think one of the, the one of the issues that we had was we had a web interface for master data services and it was a little bit clunky. So what you're going to see now with master data services is there's a new Silverlight UI to it, but even better than that, we've embraced Excel and now these data stewards can use Excel, the tool that they're familiar with, to be able to create and manage hierarchies and do a lot of the things that are related to master data services. So I think um, if you take a look at what we're doing now, uh, this will be a, a lot more productive than we have been in the past. Okay. Let me build this slide out. We'll, we'll get to this little guy in a minute, all right? I, I've got a story around that, for those of you that know what that is. I, I probably shouldn't have put it there, it's a distraction, okay? Let's talk about this new thing called the BI semantic model. Why did we need a new model? What was wrong with report builder models? Well, report builder models, like some of the competitive products, were very fragile. When you wanted to make changes, you had to, if you want to add a new computed column, you had to go and make a change to that model, push it back up there. And w one of the things about doing that as well was that when you're looking at the types of data that you could bring in, the report builder model was kind of limited. You could do SQL Server and that was about it. I think eventually we added some Oracle capabilities. But what we'd like to be able to do is have a new model, a new semantic model, where we can pull in information from basically any data source, including Hadoop, right? And because of that, we could take advantage of everything above this line because everything above this line is the Microsoft stack, right? So you leverage all the skills that you have, and the only thing that you're having to bring in here is take Hadoop data and use some of the connectors that we ship with now, and you can pull that data into SQL Server, and then we can have that go into this model. But let's talk about this, this BI semantic model, this blue box right here, and the three layers right here. So we have different applications that can connect to this new model, and the data model has two uh, interface layers to it a relational and a multi-dimensional. So this one model can be looked at in two different ways depending on what the client application, uh, how the client application wants to connect. If it's Excel, Excel can come through and say, you know what, I want to send an MDX query to this model and pull out information, right? But if I'm something like um, PowerView that I'm going to talk to you about today, I can connect to the relational side and, and talk DAX, data analysis expressions, and be able to get information out of this model as well. So there's some very complex things that you can do at a higher level. This mid layer right here, which is your business logic layer, this is where you're able to mold the data and describe how a user is going to view this data, right? You can create aggregations, computed columns, a lot of different things, create relationships between the different data sources you bring in, right? And we're giving you the Excel DAX formula way of doing that. And also, if you're an OLAP person, you can go with MDX. So there's two different ways of being able to do that. Now, for the data access and the data storage, we have something called VertiPak. Now, Ross mentioned VertiPak. For those of you who don't know what VertiPak is, this is our in-memory column store database, right? We took a snapshot from PowerPivot, and from PowerPivot, we bring in the data, and then we turn it 90 degrees and store it as columns. So we're able to get huge compressions in memory, and that's the, what we did here. We took advantage of this. So this is putting data and holding it in the BISM model. Um, but the other way we can do it is through real time. And what do we mean by that? We bring in data from Oracle. We bring in data from SAP or from 
uh, from Hadoop or whatever. But let's say that I have some data that's always being calculated through possibly something like uh, parallel data warehouse, you know, massive parallel processing. And my, my, my parallel data warehouse has calculations it's doing um, on, you know, possibly, you know, 200 terabytes of data. Do I want to pull that 200 terabytes of data in here, or would I rather take advantage of real time passing the query through directly, uh, directly through to the data source? So that's your other option here, is passing the data directly through. One thing that's great about this model, it can be accessed by a variety of different client applications. And for those of you that have uh, always said that I can't use I can't use PowerPivot right now because of security. Anything that I pull into PowerPivot, uh, I can't lock down that data so that we can do role-based security. This model supports role-based security as well. Okay. So based on this study by Gartner, <clears throat> one third of potential users are using our, our using the platform of choice. So we're looking at, you know, less than 30% here are really taking advantage of the tools that they have available to them. And what the, what the gating factor is usually is you get within an organization and we end up buying all these different tools and they don't have a familiar look and feel and it, be, it becomes a, a, basically a pain point. So what we've really tried to do is if we, you take a look at building on familiar tools and, and gaining adoption, you'll see that why Microsoft tools are, are the highest adopted tools. And I, I, would, I would, you know, I work for Microsoft, so it's not probably fair to say. I think they're really easy to use because I have to use them all the time. But um, I think if, if you've ever ta taken a look at Power Pivot and how you can take data from dis disparate data sources and be able to do uh, data mashups, uh, what we're moving towards now is a way to do this uh, through using the browser. So what we want to be able to do is give you ad hoc uh, reporting capabilities in the browser. That was kind of, Gartner always used to hit us over the head and say, you don't have this, you don't have this. Okay, now we have it. And I'm going to give you a demonstration of that today. Oh, okay. Okay. So Ross just told me I talk too much. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm going to go straight to the demo. Uh, uh, we, we have a bunch of people here today, so on the BI tracks, they're going to cover this in, in, in great detail. So let me go ahead and um, let me go ahead and switch here. Okay, I don't owe you anything now. Okay. Let's see if I can maximize this. Okay, something changed with my resolution. I'm just going to go with this anyway. All right, so what we are, we're sitting in the SharePoint, and I have a BISM or a BI semantic model that was published to the server. So now what you can see is I have a couple reports down at the bottom, but I also have an auto sales model there. So if I were to go to that auto sales model and click on it, this is what I'd basically see. I would see a design surface, and then I would see all the different fields and some of the aggregations uh, on my right-hand side. Across the top of the window, um, you can see that there's a bunch of, uh, there's a toolbar up there. And with the toolbar, we can do a bunch of different things. But I just kind of wanted to run you through how easy it is to be able to use this ad hoc tool. Remember that we're just sitting in the browser here, and we're, we're basically uh, just accessing uh, BI semantic model, and we can just go and party on this data all, di all day long, and uh, you know, the model will guide us through what we can and what we can do. So when I click on cars here, there are a bunch of fields in cars here on the right-hand side, and you can see which ones are being displayed over here. But one of the things I wanted to show you, if I wanted to get rid of some values, on the left-hand side, I can just unclick this. And it's very much like an Excel type of feeling uh, when, you're, when you're working with this. Um, some of the things that you'll see is if I click on the actual object, then all of a sudden the toolbar changes to different 
um, objects that I can convert it to. Like I convert it to a card, I can convert it to a matrix. You can see there's other things that have been blocked out here, but I'll show you how those are going to be used as well. Um, another thing here too is to take a look at, I have this whole list of data here, but what we also offer you is a filter area. Now, the filter area on the right hand side says, I want to filter either the whole view or I want to come in and filter uh, a control. So there's a hierarchy there as well. But what will happen is, let's say that I just wanted to filter uh, based on the types of cars. What I do is I drag and drop over here. And then what I could do is said, I'm just interested in hybrids, SUVs, and trucks. And what that'll do for me is give me a way to be able to filter what I'm looking at on the left hand side. All right? There's sorting. Uh, if I wanted to sort these cars uh, by MPG on the highway, I can do that. You have the sorting capability as well. All right? So for the sake of time, what I want to do is I'm going to go forward to another report and just show you some of these other capabilities that we have. So one thing is on the right, upper right hand side, I want you to notice there's a timeline down at the bottom. We have a scatter chart. On the bottom here, we have gas prices starting out in Q1 of 2006 going all the way to Q1 of 2011. So you can see the gas prices. And what I want to look at here is I want to take a look at car sales versus gas prices versus time. So what you can do is you can come in here and we can run this and we can actually see uh, what's been going on with the car sales here over time. And we have put the, the gas price down at the bottom just to give you an idea of what's going on there, right? So one thing I want to point out here, let's take a look at this in a little more detail. And remember, this is all hap happening in the browser. One thing I can do is I can go in here and select. So I want, to, I want to look at the difference between hybrids and SUVs. That's what I care about here. I just want to see the difference here. So as we take a look here, and I can pause while it's running, we can get an idea of hybrids. Look at this lower sales here. And I want you to notice a big change that happens right here. Anyone know what happens right here, why hybrid sales skyrocketed? Cash for clunkers, right? Cash for clunkers caused that line to go up like that. And these are the kind of insights that you can get by looking at this and t correlating it with other data that might be coming out of the Azure market. Um, so another thing that we can do is we can come up here and I can say file export to PowerPoint and we'll call this <laughs> I'm going to call it SQL SAT and I'm going to replace it I guess I already did this save and export all right so now let's go down and it should be up here somewhere here it is I want you to see what we're getting and I want you to ignore the activation. Okay. Let's take a look at what we get. What we get is we get a snapshot when we saved. Okay? So inside I'm I'm uh, this might look confusing right now. I'm running a PowerPoint presentation in presentation mode right now. All right? What I saved was that view. So when we had that view open and I saved it, wherever we stopped is where it's going to be saved. What you're not seeing right here is in the lower right hand corner. Let me get my mouse back. And say you're doing a presentation for somebody. Interact, click to interact. So trying to get my mouse to work. So what you're seeing now is we are actually inside a PowerPoint with a live open window inside of PowerPoint so we can run this report for anyone that we're presenting to. Okay? Now, 
when we do this, and if someone makes a modification to the report up on the server, that will be propagated into our PowerPoint presentation when you click on the Interact. Okay? Am I done? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it always happens. I always get booted. <laughs> no. Yeah. So we started 50 minutes late. I definitely want to move the session forward so we don't throw off everyone else throughout the remainder of the day. So thank you very much, Alex. Excellent job. And, and we'll definitely spend some more time in, in, we have dedicated sessions from Peter Myers. That's deep dive on business intelligence, power pivot, power of view. So definitely attend that one session. So in order for us to wrap up, I want to focus on one other, one other area. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have agility in terms of offering different solutions where you can take advantage of private cloud solutions, public cloud solutions, or on-premise solutions, and we have the tight integration amongst the three. Therefore, with that being said, I also want to introduce Britt Johnston, who is our group program manager affiliated with our appliance team, and he's going to showcase some of the different appliances that we have available to achieve a private cloud, to achieve data warehousing and BDA technologies. Thank you very much, Britt. the room have seen one of our appliances so very few of you so uh, so there's a uh, there's a session I'll give later today where we'll, we'll dive into the whole family of appliances and look at them in detail I, w I don't have time to go into that today but I want to give you a sense for for some of the things that we have done around this first of all we're trying to make sure we're really creating higher level building blocks so don't think of the appliances as the finished solution from your perspective. We, I don't think of them that way. Think of it as something of, rather than starting with a raw server, you start with a server that has more capabilities. And, and we're trying to deliver software in a new way through those appliances. We're trying to make sure that we take advantage of all the optimization that we can do in terms of building that system. And there's some really exciting things that we've done around that. Getting, getting dramatic performance improvements out of the hardware by really looking hard at a very specific implementation. And since we have end-to-end -end all the parts and pieces there, we, we can do some dramatic things. In, uh, in many cases, we work directly with the hardware designers on the system and, and use that knowledge to be able to optimize the, the specific solution. We also try to make sure that we provide more completeness. So for example, all the appliances that we build have management packs associated with them so that you can view the state of health of that, uh, of that solution from uh, the other management tools you might have in your domain. We, uh, on the slide here, this is a busy slide, but uh, shows some interesting stuff uh, around that. We, we all know that you can build your own, and, and we expect that many people can continue to do that. What we're trying to do is build out really uh, a, a variety of choices that, uh, that allow you to, to optimize your time. In terms, of, in terms of time to solution, lowering the overall risk that you have. Uh, and within this, you can see here, we have, we have reference architectures that we offer, we have specific appliances that we offer, and we have cloud services that we offer. And the idea is to have that whole family all fit together so that you can choose whether you're gonna build it yourself, you're gonna start with an appliance to help you uh, solve that problem, or even go to a cloud service to help you solve that problem. So providing an end-to-end, -end, really a spectrum of choices that you're able to, to leverage in that. In my session, I'll go into, in the interest of time, uh, I, in my session, I'll, I'll go into all the details about the family of products and describe them in detail. And then I'll dive deeply into our private cloud appliance, which, which I'm very excited about. Uh, that's now available for use. And when I say private cloud appliance, uh, that appliance is based on the Microsoft Private Cloud Reference Architecture, and we've created an instantiation of that reference architecture that is an appliance. It's built in a factory, uh, and everyone gets the exact same thing. Uh, that might not necessarily be exciting to you, but if you know how complex it is to build your own private cloud, there are 12 different networks. The, there are 28 pieces of software that you need to integrate together 
all that complexity is solved in a way that everyone gets the, the, a, a valid starting point for, for that solution. You get a building block that, that, that you can create. Uh, we, we figured out a way to take that private cloud problem, solve it in a factory, and deliver that thing as a functional private cloud. It's the only solution like that in the industry uh, and, and something we're, we're excited about. I'll talk more about that in, in detail uh, in my session uh, later today. With that, I'll uh, keep things moving along. Sure, so I gave you sure. some time back there. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to wrap up. I do have a call to action. So I wanted to have Michael Reese, our group or our program managers affiliated with um, Beyond Relational, talk about some of our new technologies with regards to unstructured data, structured data, and some semantic search affiliated with that. However, due to the interest of time, I'm going to redirect you to his. He has two sessions today. And Michael Reese, you're welcome to stand up and introduce yourself and say, let everyone see who you are. Hey everybody. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I will be talking about uh, file table and semantic search at 4. And at 1.30, I will be talking about SQL Server and NoSQL. So I would love to see you there. Talk to you later. Thank you. Okay. So with regards to the call to action, so what we're looking at is definitely attend our SQL Server 2012 track. We have a lot of new features and functionality affiliated with SQL 2012. Very proud of the, the product. Um, listen in next week, you'll probably hear the announcements with regards to when we RTM the product and, and the specific dates affiliated with RTM and our general availability. Um, we do have business productivity sessions, so if you want to see more of the business intelligence in action, we have a room in Galaxy where you can actually see this stuff in action. One of my colleagues will be out there and you can definitely um, um, sit with him, walk through these different scenarios. We do have Microsoft Technology Center tour. Therefore, you want to see the Microsoft Technology Center. We have hardware from many of our alliance partners. I believe there's a $10 million worth of hardware in there where we do a lot of our proof of concepts design sessions. Um, we do have Ask the Expert booths downstairs, so feel free to talk to our Microsoft people or MVPs and get your questions. We do want you to fill in the evaluation forms. We do have an Xbox Connect um, drawing at the end of the day. Please follow us on Twitter. I, I found out there's another SQL Saturday somewhere else in the United States going on at the same time frame. I want to make sure that we beat them and we let them know how powerful our community is. So definitely get on Twitter, follow the folks in the room from a Microsoft perspective. And finally, I just want everyone to have fun. I know it's a weekend. I do appreciate everyone's time. And um, I do appreciate you coming out here on a weekend. Thank you, Ross. And sorry. I, I do, have one, I do have one last announcement. So the product, I have a, a book, SQL 2012, coming out within the next two to three weeks time frame, and the product group will allow us to give that away for free. So feel free to follow me on Twitter, and I'll release the specific download link where you can get the new book for free. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Ross. So I've been asked to, or I was asked earlier to demystify the room locations. I failed to do so in my initial shot at it, so here it is. So the... SQL Server 2012 launch track is here in this room all day long. And by the way, there's an electrical outlet at every seat. So if you're in here, you can take advantage of that. You can recharge the batteries that have been running down throughout this keynote, <laughs> like my own. OK, then the database administration track is in the Mercury room, which is the next room over. In fact, there are five tracks that are on this floor, and there's one track on the first floor. So database administration is the next room over, Mercury. Development is the room past that, which is Jupiter. The next room down is Saturn, and that is going to be the site of the business intelligence track. Okay? The uh, track five on, on the cloud in Azure is going to be downstairs in the nebula room. So you go down the stairs and across the hall for that track. And then the fifth track, the bonus track, is in the executive conference room, which is all the way down and to the left, down the hallway here and to the left. So I hope that has uh, helped. We're going to try to recoup a little bit of the time that we've lost between uh, uh, sl potentially slightly shortened sessions, but a tighter time frame for lunch as well. And uh, thank you very much for attending today. We're really excited to have you here.
Thank you very much.